everyone. I'm Reagan Kramer, host of Revelations Podcast, where we are devoted to sharing the revelation of Jesus Christ and the freedom that comes from following Him through biblical teachings and the redemptive stories of our guests. Follow us on Instagram at therevelations.podcast and subscribe to our website, therevelationspodcast.com, where you can find all of our podcasts on YouTube as well as your favorite platform. As you listen today, may God give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Hey everyone, welcome back to Revelations Podcast, and I'm super excited to invite my friend Jenny Meyer back to the show. Hey Jenny, how's it going? I am so excited to chat with you again. I always love our time together. I know, I do too. And we've actually been texting a little bit here and yeah. you've had some really fun, interesting things on your podcast, the Rooted Truth Podcast. Yeah. And you're just an amazing woman of God. You're a mother, a wife, and you have not only a podcast, but you're a Bible teacher. And you guys have been digging in uh, to a lot of interesting things. I've done your Bible yes. study before. I've done Daniel with you and the covenants, which was super fun and very eye-opening. And I've I've actually done quite a few Bible studies in my life, and you guys just, I love how you um, and Lori just really get your heads together and research it on your own, and it's really yeah. sharing uh, what the Lord and the Holy Spirit is bringing up through what you've learned in the past and then what He's revealing now. Well, thank you. I mean, that's an honor, and really, like, this is all all God. I mean, bringing Lori and I together and as far as writing together, that can be difficult, but mm -hmm. it's not for us. Um, we literally both write. We send it back and forth like 15 times. And, you know, I think it's just really cool to see how God is moving Who when he, he'll show me something one way and he'll show Lori the same thing, but in a different way. And then when we talk about it, we're like, no way. Like, mm -hmm. And so, just a lot of confirmation and we've had so much fun doing these studies. Um, Daniel, I think was was one of my favorites just because it sh it shifted a lot for me and really helps me understand old testament prophecy you know everything i think what we're going to kind of talk about today as well mm -hmm. but um it was fun so thank you because that that really means a lot coming from you <laughs> it was really fun and i was always like okay i have a million things i want to talk about but there's like people on the screen with us and i don't want you know, it's yep. always it's always interesting, but I loved it. And I want to just preface, you know, before we get into this topic, we're going to talk about the end times, we're going to talk about revelation, we're going to talk about eschatology, but you have really uh, just courageously come forth and started to share some of these things on your podcast, The Root of Truth. And I also want to mention that you and um, Lori from Remnant Rising and Amy from Eyes on the Right, you're all working on kind of just like this Christian women's community that are like-minded and you have an app called The Root of Truth, which is very cool if people want to look that up. But uh, you have, you know, you, you guys are doing tons of things and I don't know how you have the time to do it. But I, I just want to say I'm thankful that you are stepping out and just sharing what you're learning and what the Holy Spirit's bringing to you. Um, and it takes courage. And I really do feel like you are doing it with uh, great humility, but power in the Holy Spirit, you know, like John did, right? Yeah. So, well, thank you. It's it's tough, but it's fun. And I, and I do get passionate about it. And I'm sure that you'll kind of sense that today because it's, to me, it's a fun topic because as we'll get is. to maybe at the end, but it's shifted everything in my life um, and just moving forward in, in my walk with, with Jesus. So I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah, so you've gotten some pushback, but we prayed before that who's ever <laughs> yes. listening would open their hearts, you know, to just listen. And we, we all need to be teachable. So, yeah. okay, yeah. Jenny, so let's start with uh, what, like, what is eschatology? What is that word? There's all these big words we're going to talk about today. I know. Yep. And I know, like, I've been reading the Bible for 25 years, and still some of these, I'm like, oh, yeah, what is that again? And especially when you yep. get to the end times, the dispensationalism, like, yep. it gets confusing. Yep. Yes, it does. Um, essentially, eschatology is the study of end times or kind of like the end of the world as we know it. Um, sometimes it can even go into the study of what happens when someone dies, what what type of judgment, death, all of this. But really, I, I, I look at it as like the end, quote unquote, end times or last days. Um, the the word eska in greek is means last or farthest away and then ology obviously means the study of so the last days end times and there are a lot of different views on the end times um and 
different words, right? And it took me yeah. finally sitting down a couple of years ago and like really mapping this out and researching like, okay, what does this mean? Because I'm told at that point, I, I was told I was a dispensationalist, but I was like, I have no clue what that even means. Um, granted, I have gone... 180 from there since then but do you want me to kind of break down just really quick like the major views of the end times yeah i was gonna say because i i became a christian when i was like 25 and that is right when uh those books came out yeah um, <laughs> uh left behind series right yes. and i remember everyone at work talking about them and i was like okay i'm gonna start reading these books i think i read like two and then i got freaked out <laughs> yeah yeah so i stopped reading them and at that point, I was such a young Christian, I didn't realize like, okay, reading these books and like reading the Bible should cause conviction, you know, and we are supposed to follow the Lord with fear and trembling, like, you know, work out our salvation. But yeah. like, what does that actually mean? But I found myself being afraid all the time. Yeah. yeah. And that, you know, now looking back, probably wasn't from the Lord. Like if I had the real love of Christ, why, why would I be afraid? And I know you can speak to that. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it was the same for me. I was raised in the church. This was all I was taught, this seven-year tribulation period. There's going to be an Antichrist. Um, the Left Behind series came out. You know, everyone was pushing it. Then the actual movies came out from the books, and it, there's hype over it. And mm -hmm. I think that, that Hollywood has had a big, big hand in that. There's a lot of money. I mean, Lori and I were just talking about this the other day. There's a lot of money in the dispensational end time theology as far as fear sells, right? All these movies. And and I remember, I don't even know if it was the Left Behind movies, but a movie that I watched um, years ago, I just remember like the, there was a pilot and then poof, he was gone. And, you know, all these like wrecks and plane crashes. And for me, I'm like, okay, at least I'll be out of here. Like that's literally <laughs> like you kind of like, but then you're like, oh gosh, like, but all these other people are left for this apocalyptic, like scary times. But when you really dive into Revelation, Revelation is the revealing of, that's the word apocalypse. It means the revealing of Jesus Christ. Like it is about Jesus. And when you look at Revelation with those lens where, okay, where are we seeing him revealed? your your view starts to change it and so i think a lot i mean we'll get into this but i think a lot of it actually has to do with the revealing of of the new covenant and what that means as believers um so yeah real quick the major views on the end times so we have like this dispensational view and within that view i know you and i have talked about this there's the pre mid or post tribulation rapture so there's the rapture of the church overall all that view is like church age, society grows evil, like the current time that we're in, there's a seven-year tribulation and great persecution. Um, at that beginning of that seven years, an antichrist will um, make a peace agreement. He'll break that peace agreement three and a half years in. The church is either raptured before the seven years, middle of the seven years, or after the seven years. Um, then after that seven years, Jesus comes back with the church and reigns and boom, it's done. Um, but within that view, let me say it, it, there's a lot of moving pieces that you have to kind of make fit. And that's the part I really didn't understand until I dug in um, for myself. Then you have the all millennialism um, and that really believes, so the, the thousand year, quote unquote, thousand year reign of Christ in Revelation 20. When you look at that Greek word thousand, it actually means uncertain affinity. So it's an unknown amount of time. And the all millennialist view believes that we are in that time right now with Jesus reigning spiritually at the right hand of the Father and in the hearts of believers because we are the temple of God. So, He is reigning right now. So, they really just see the entire church age, quote unquote, um, with tribulation throughout it, with Jesus reigning now. And then when He comes back, that is the second coming. So, there's no rapture um, of the church. That is the second coming of Christ. And then there's eternity when God makes new heavens, new earth. Um, right. Then you have the post-millennialism. This view really views, um, they kind of agree with like the, the un uncertain affinity view of that term thousand, but they view this age that we're in as society eventually grows better 
like so things get better and there's a great time of peace it, it's not a set thousand years, but there's a great time of peace before the second coming of Christ, and then there's eternity. Um, and then you have within those views, there are kind of like little views, just real quick, um, the historical view of Revelation. They believe that Revelation has happened from the time John wrote it up until present, and it's still going until Jesus returns. Like, it's slowly been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. um, there's the preterists who believe that all of it was fulfilled in the first century, and then the partial preterists believe that most of it was fulfilled in the first century, and we are still awaiting the return of Jesus um, and Satan being defeated once and for, for all. Then you have the futurists. Those are typically the dispensationalists. Um, they believe that all of it has not happened yet. Like, we're waiting. We're, we're not there yet. Revelation maybe is just starting now, I mean, especially in the world that we live in today, but it has not happened yet. Um, and then the last one is really the idealist, and they believe that the majority of the book of Revelation is really this huge spiritual battle taking place in the heavenly realms. So, there's multiple fulfillments on, on our physical earth, what we see. So, it's kind of just all over the place, multiple fulfillments, um, and it's more spiritual than not. So, I know that was a lot I just threw out there. No, that was really good, because I don't think, you know, I've listened to a lot of podcasts about this, and I don't know if anyone's broken them all down in the beginning, mm -hmm. and so I think that's really a great idea. I mean, I, I hope everyone's getting their notes out because <laughs> listening to that again because it was a great description. And uh, I remember, you know, doing a couple like big Bible studies that went through Daniel, and I mean, well-known people, and it's like, okay, so are you pre-rapture, you know, mid-trib, you know, post-trib, pre-trib rapture, and it's like, I, I always felt like I had to, like I had stress over it that I had to like make a decision about mm -hmm. what, where I stood and all of that. And I went so far, I remember spending a whole weekend before we had Henry and I had out all my books. I was online looking, you know, at all the history, the bloodlines of the pre-Antichrist, Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth, and yeah. like, where is he from? And then where's the Antichrist gonna, I mean, I had, pages and pages of things type out trying to figure this out because I thought if I was a Christian, I should know this. And yeah. I'm st I was still like, okay, I think I know where I stand. You know, I'm thinking, you know, pre pre trib, I want to be raptured before it all goes down, like you said. Right. You know, yeah. and then, you know, his bloodline could be this. And it's like it just got so crazy and confusing and I thought, okay, maybe God just doesn't want us to know this, right? And just trusting Him. But where, so where, who would you say you are? Like, where do you stand? Are you a partial I preterist? Would, I would say right now I am a partial preterist with an all millennial viewpoint. Okay. So okay. Um, I believe that we, that Christ is reigning right now. He told us that the kingdom, his kingdom is not of this world. And mm -hmm. so I do not believe that he will come back and physically reign for a thousand years of peace. I believe when he comes back, that is good. Like that is, that's it. Mm -hmm. It's done. We are with him forever. So yeah. I would say, yeah, partial preterist, um, all millennial and more of an optimistic, honestly, all millennial. Sure. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, when, Jenny, when was the moment, right, where you were like, okay, I'm not sure if I believe most of what people are saying out there. Yeah. yeah. Great question. Um, honestly, I would probably say 2020. Like I said, I was raised in the church, raised um, being taught the seven-year tribulation, Antichrist, um, all of this coming. And 2020, I think for the majority of people out there, the question started, started being raised, right? And um, I started just feeling like when I really started re reading Revelation again, digging in, I started feeling uneasy. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make sense that there's a seven year tribulation in the book of Revelation. There is no mention of a seven year tribulation at all. It talks about time, times and half a time, 1260 days, 42 months, all of that, but not a seven year tribulation. And so I, my first kind of um, step to, to all of this is, Okay, where did this seven-year tribulation theology come from? Mm -hmm. It came from what's known as Daniel's 70th week, which comes from Daniel 9. And so, that's really when I was like, okay, I need to understand the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. So, I 
read Daniel multiple times. I listened to different um, sermons, different perspectives on it. And I think that's the biggest thing that I can tell anyone out there is when you're questioning things, listen to all the perspectives on it, then pray about it. And what is the Holy Spirit stirring up in you, right? Um, so don't just shut off like one view just because you're like, eh, you know, that doesn't make like, nope, nope. Um, because I think honestly, that's that's where you get like the pridefulness of, nope, I'm right. This is wrong. I'm not even going to listen to what they have to say. Um, and so I did that with the Daniel 70th week, Daniel 9, and really started studying the um, Hebrew words. Daniel 9 was written in Hebrew prior to that, and Daniel was written in Ar Aramaic, but Daniel 9, Hebrew, understanding what was his prayer. His prayer was about his people. And the angel Gabriel comes and and tells him, here's what's going to happen with your people, gives him a 490-year prophecy known as the 70-week prophecy. Um, that's a whole podcast in of itself, um, breaking that down. But understanding that the last four verses in Daniel 9 where people say it's talking about an antichrist mm. standing and, and decimating a temple, it's not. It's talking about Jesus. It's his ministry. That's why sacrifice was taken away. It says he was cut off in the middle of the week. Jesus was crucified th three and a half years when, after he started his ministry. So, his ministry started the 70th week of Daniel. Um, and we, we do have this, um, a, a, goodness, I would say it's probably a 15, 20 page PDF on our website for people to download that breaks it down. So, if you, if you want to learn more about that, um, check that out. But um, it's about Jesus. It's not about an antichrist. The the 70th week of Daniel already happens. Um, so, that was my beginning step into it. And then after that, understanding Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, which people say is all about end times and the, and the great tribulation. Mm -hmm. um, and then the past year or so is when I really immersed myself again into studying Revelation, but again, looking at what each view believed and why they believed it um and then prayed about it and and i i feel the holy spirit just confirming with peace and that's the biggest thing is that there's no fear so hmm. that's wild so why you know i'm learning so much about theology seminary you know what we're taught what's changed in the last 200 years possibly you know yeah. why do you think it seems like this you know pre-trib rapture seems to be like most people believe that i guess in my circles anyway yeah. who like who started teaching that has that been going on forever is this a new thing or um that dispensational Lism really was made popular in the 1800s. So, I mean, we're talking 200 years, really. And some people say, well, no, it was around before that. But from my study and research, it came out of the Counter-Reformation in the 1600s, 1700s, and it was made popular in the 1800s, coming from a Jesuit priest. Um, and who really made it popular was John Nelson Darby, and then C.I. Schofield, which I'm sure you've heard of the Schofield Reference Bible, right, yeah. was, was took Nel Darby's work um, and really ran with it. And that's where I see where it really started coming into seminaries. And more specifically, the Dallas Theological Seminary is one of the bigger ones that that is all they teach. And it is this, um, there's nothing else. And so, I mean, when, you, when you're looking at eschatology, you're like, okay, so this view really was made popular 200 or so years ago. Right. What, what was before that? What did the early church fathers believe? You know, what, what about those 15, 1600 years prior to that? So, yeah. And so, what have, what have you learned? I mean, I know you talk about Josephus a lot. He was a historian, which mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, we learn a lot about him. <laughs> no, not at all. And why is he? He's really important if, as we're looking at some of these topics. Yeah, he really is. And I ended up getting the complete works of Josephus. Um, it's available and it's thicker than my Bible. <laughs> like it is so thick. And I have not read through it cover to cover, but um, that's where I do love the internet because you hear something like, oh, well, he talks about this and this book. And it's very detailed, just like the Bible, where you can look up the wars of the Jews 
book four point five point two and and like it's a chunk in there but at least it like specifies and kind of narrows it down so that's how i started doing the research on it but he was a first century jewish historian so from my understanding he was a jew he was not a believer in jesus um he documented so much of the jewish history even leading up to Jesus, after Jesus. Um, and during that first century war, the Jewish Roman war, he was captured by the Romans and kind of taken into the general's quarters and um, was required to document everything. And so he documented every single detail of that war. And I think, I, yeah, I mean, it's just really, really cool to see how it um, corresponds. And my understanding, I'm like, this seems like it's fulfilling prophecy in the Bible, um, the way he explains it. So, yeah, I think he's really important. Um, and understanding that Jewish Roman War um, from 66 to 70 AD is of utmost importance before you take a stance on, on what you believe the end times are. Amen. Yeah. And that's what kind of got me really into, you know, it is a paradigm shift because I started, I don't know what, probably from you. I mean, I've heard a little bit of this before and I was, I've always been very interested in the Jewish Roman war from 70 AD. In my spirit, mm -hmm. there was something like really, it obviously is big because the temple fell, right? Yeah, the second yeah. temple falling, like that is a big deal. But I hadn't heard a lot of teaching on why it was important yeah. and, until recently. And so do you want to get into that a little bit more? Because that is something that really, like, ugh, guy, like guys, I did, like you don't want to like, oh my gosh, I got to do all this research. Like yeah. now what's really going on? I mean, it's a whole nother thing, right? That yeah. you have yeah. to like prepare your mind for, pray about. And I, when I took your Daniel study, I was like, oh man, I don't even know if I want to get into all this because I am so, I got so much going on. But it really yeah. has, I would say, it, it was, it's been orderly. Like I have more order in the understanding of the gospels, you know, even Matthew yeah. and Luke related to Daniel, yeah. related to Revelation. And it, it, yeah, it does take some time to get into, but pray about it. Ask, we're going to, you're going to give us some scripture here too, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Once you start to understand what went down in history in 70 AD, it's like, whoa, okay, yep. I can start yep. to see this. Yep, absolutely. And that was something that really changed everything for I know myself and for Lori too, you know, as we went about this journey together. And that's what's really cool too. If you can go on this journey with a good friend and yeah and study together. And so you're really like, you don't feel alone in it and, and not knowing where to start. And so um, God really blessed us both in, in that and this journey that we've been on. But that, that first century is so, so important. Um, Jesus proclaimed destruction and judgment on that generation. We, we know, and, and I'll probably get into this a little bit more in just a bit, but Matthew 23, he is talking to the Pharisees, all these woes against the Pharisees. And at the, the end of Matthew 23, he says that all this is to come on this generation, that you're responsible for all the blood of the prophets and the saints, um, and, and it's on you guys, right? And so, you have to think, well, you look at scripture, generation is 40 years, according to scripture. And Jesus died in 30 AD. He, I know that there are some people that say 33 AD, but with all the research and like looking at history and what lines up, 30 AD, um, April of 30 AD is what honestly fits the 70th week of Daniel, all of that. Um, so within a generation, you have to think 40 years from, from him saying that, is 70 AD. And in 66, the Roman armies surrounded Jerusalem. And Cestius was the general at that time. And he pulled out unexpectedly. So they surrounded Jerusalem. He pulled out. And when the Christians saw that, they heeded Jesus's warnings of Matthew 24 and got out of Jerusalem. And so then once, once that happened, the Christians were out. Um, in, in the wilderness, in the mountains of Pella, and like, like again, we'll talk about in just a minute of Matthew 24, but came back, then you have um, Vespasian was the general, and his son Titus was helping him. That Jewish-Roman war was three and a half years, and when I saw that, 
I literally was like, like, no, this can't be right. Can't be right. Three and a half years. That's we see three and a half years all in Revelation. We see three and a half years talked about in Daniel. Like, there's no way that's three and a half years. But the beginning of the rebellion started in spring of 66. So that was kind of the start of their year. And then the final fall of Jerusalem was the end of August, early September of 70 AD. It's literally all of 66, 67. Wait, yes. I may get that. I may have some of those those dates wrong, but the war actually, so the war started in 66. 66 and then, yeah. yes, wrapped up um, end of August, early September, 70 AD. Um, when I don't have dates right in front of me, I'm like trying to wrap, like get that it right in my sense. brain. But, that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, three and a half years. And that final siege actually was a five month siege, um, which took the temple down in 70. So that started on, on Passover, which that was really interesting on Passover when all the surrounding Jews from all of Israel have, they had to come to the city to Jerusalem for Passover. So that's why you had all of these millions of Jews in Jerusalem at this time. So that final siege um, with General Titus started on Passover of 70 AD and culminated with the fall of the temple early September AD. So five months, um, which that gets into a whole other thing in Revelation with, with the five months that was given to the locusts, um, with, you know, the, the, trumpets and it's just really 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 interesting so all of these dates for me kind of changed my look my outlook on it and i just started digging in even more hmm. so so this general comes to take over the temple jerusalem but he stops mm -hmm. do we know why mm -mm. no just okay. says that that they pulled back and when they pulled back, the Jewish rebel forces went out after them. So it, it gave the Christians enough space to then get out of Jerusalem during well, that time. Probably God's mercy because the well, yeah, true exactly. believers in Christ, right? We're yep. like, wait a minute. So like you're saying, like they're thinking back to the prophetic scriptures and yep. because yep. they were, I mean, you know, it's a generation. But yeah, that is super fascinating because they know yep. the prophecies of the Old Testament, right? I mean, some of this is being written. Do you know when John, do we know when John wrote Revelation? This is this is a highly, highly debated topic, really right. debated. Um, there is a huge camp of people that say it's between 90 and 95 AD. So if that was the case, this could have nothing to do with with the fall of the temple and there is the other camp that says no this was during the time of nero 64 65 ish before the war started and both arguments i mean honestly have um good good reasons but you know a lot of people that that tend to say that it's in in the 90s just have never looked at the reasons why the other camp says in the 60s. And so after really digging in, it made more sense for it to be in the 60s for me because John was, I mean, what, roughly a little bit younger than than Jesus. And, um, and so if you put him in the 90s, I mean, he had to have been 90, 90-ish, hmm. 90 right? He was yeah. that old. Um, would he have been exiled at that time to Patmos um, at that age? So I don't know. There's just a lot of debate about it. Um, but some of the, the questions that both Lori and I asked ourselves was, okay, so does John talk about the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened during that time in Revelation? You'd think if that such a big thing happened, he would have referenced it at, at some point. Um, and then once you look at the symbolism throughout revelation what same symbolism do you find in the old testament so how does that parallel right so we have to let the the bible interpret the bible as far as the symbolism because those first century jews knew old testament symbolism they knew it um and then what tribulation was john saying he was a part of in revelation 1 9 it says he's a fellow partaker in tribulation what tribulation was that mm. um and so then another question that somebody asked Lori this and they said well why is revelation the last book of the bible like why did the bible stop being written and when you kind of stop and think think about that and you look at the destruction of the temple as 
in a way, the destruction of the Old Covenant, because the temple was the very embodiment of, of the Mosaic Covenant. That, that was where they met God. That's where they did um, animal sacrifices, their atonement, all of this. The Holy of Holies was considered heaven yeah. to them because that's where God dwelt. Um, and so, the temple really was the embodiment of the that mosaic or the old covenant. And so, if you look at that, like, okay, it is, is revelation, these are just the questions that we asked ourselves, is revelation in a way, the destruction of the old covenant, and then the revealing of Jesus is that new covenant, you know. And so, is that why the the Bible stopped at that point? Because the old covenant was done. We have everything that we need in the new covenant. So, those are some of the questions that we started um, really asking ourselves. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot though. Um, so, uh, it is. <laughs> like, so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I I mean I believe going back to the question I believe that it was written sixty four ish sixty five eighty that's that's the stance and that was a big shift for me um, mm -hmm. but again listening to um, some some debates on it and um, mm -hmm. from from well known scholars on both ends so sure so yeah because I'm thinking about that verse I think it is Matthew twenty four like when one is left one is taken right and that's what we all think about like from the movies and they're in the airplane and half the airplane's gone, right? I think that's how yep. Left Behind yep. starts. Yep. And so it that is interesting when you read like they're on the rooftop, like why would yeah. we be on the rooftops right now? Like exactly. Yeah. That kind yep. like there's it it's it's for that generation if it was Jesus saying like if he's meaning actually that in this actual generation, in these next 40 years, there will be this abomination that causes desolation. Um, that would make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, do you want to get into the yeah. Olivet Discourse a yeah. little bit? So, what is okay. the Olivet Discourse? Let's start there. Okay, so the Olivet Discourse is basically Matthew 24, when Jesus is talking to his disciples. So, to set the stage for that, you have Matthew 23, like I said, all the woes that Jesus is proclaiming on the Pharisees, um, the scribes, and calling them hypocrites. We have in Matthew 23, starting in verse 36 through 38, it says, Assuredly, I say to you, all of these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. Mm -hmm. So that kind of wraps up the, all those woes to the Pharisees. Then Jesus leaves the temple with his disciples, goes up on the mountain, and the disciples look back, right? And um, really, they're, they're asking questions. First, Jesus, like, they're, they're admiring the temple, like, look how great that is, right? <laughs> and Jesus says, you know, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. That's a, that's talking about the temple because they're admiring the temple, um, and then they go on to ask him a couple different things. Or I mean, th you can kind of break it down to three things in Matthew twenty four, two in Luke twenty one. But when will these things be? So you have to ask yourself what what things were they talking about? Right? Mm -hmm. They're talking about what he just proclaims both to to the Pharisees what he was just talking about, all these things will come upon this generation. And the, the, when he said, not, stone, not one stone will be left upon another, right? And so, he's talking about the destruction, this judgment that's coming on the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. Then um, their other question is, what will be the sign of your coming? Okay, we have to stop here and say, did the, Pharise or did the, the disciples know that Jesus was going to die, be resurrected, ascend into heaven, to where they'd be talking about him coming back physically to earth. No. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't know that. And so they didn't know all that was going to happen. And so they are literally talking about when when is your coming of judgment of what you just said to the Pharisees, right. the temple being destroyed. Um, and the phrase coming on 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 the clouds, really when you look at Old Testament, more often than not, it means coming in judgment. Mm 
Hmm. It doesn't mean his second return to earth, phys- physically to earth. It means coming in judgment on a nation. And then the last question is the end of the age that we find in Matthew. Um, so, what, what's the end of the age? We have to understand that they knew they were in the Mosaic age, the old covenant age, which roughly ag- ages last roughly 2,000 years. So, we have from Abraham to Moses, 2,000 years, Moses to Jesus, roughly 2,000 years, right? So, they're talking about the end of the age, the end of the old covenant. They know the temple is going to be destroyed. They know Jesus is going to come in judgment on that generation. So, that's what they're talking about. When's the end of the age? It's not referencing the end of the world as we know it because they would have no idea that that was coming down in in the future at any point, right? So, when looking at this, you know, he goes on, he starts talking about, um, you know, these things take hold, hold. Take heed that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name. So he's talking about false Christ, so the Antichrist spirit. And um, he starts talking about wars, rumors of wars, um, again, false prophets. And once we get into verse 15, it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay, so Matthew was written to Jews. They absolutely understood what Daniel's prophecy was talking about. This stems back to Daniel 12, verse 11, where it says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So that's what he is referring to as far as the abomination spoken of by Daniel. And once you understand Daniel, what Daniel's talking about, Daniel's talking about the first century destruction um, in Daniel 12. And um, we also know this by going to Luke 21. So, Luke 21 is the same story, but told by Luke, um, same, same, all of it discourse, but told by Luke. And Luke is writing to Gentiles. So, Gentiles would not understand that phrase, the abomination of desolation. So, he actually says in Luke 21, 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country into her. Um, For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. That little phrase right there of verse 22 is the finishing of Isaiah 61 when Jesus was speaking in the temple and he's reading Isaiah, but he doesn't say that last verse of these are the days of vengeance. He says it here to his disciples that once you see the abomination of desolation, which we know from Luke is Jerusalem surrounded by armies. So, that's, I mean, all throughout Matthew 24 you can absolutely see how it played out in the physical between between 66 and 70 AD was um, really that abomination of desolation was when the army surrounded. So, then when he says like, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, that's what they did. Hmm. They did that when the army pulled back. Um, The Christians who like knew like this is what they were talking about. So, we got to get out of here basically. Yep. Yep. And then did they stay? So, those Christians stayed in because that was three and a half years, right? Then the yep. temple fell. Yep. And then when did they eventually come back? Do we know that? Just after that, um, word got okay. back to them, and that's when they started coming back. You know, the gospel is being preached all over, too, mm-hmm. um, throughout this time. But but yeah, that's when they, they came back. And um, where it says that they are gathered, I don't have that verse right in front of me, um, where the elect are gathered, that's them coming back after after the war. And so, when you get into what you said about um, one will be taken and the other left, mm-hmm. there is a good argument that what the Romans did, so say two people were working in the field, they would go out, they would murder one, so murder one right in the field and take the other one captive. So, there were actually, not only were they um, 
in in Jerusalem, right, coming in and conquering Jerusalem, they took people captive if, as well. So you didn't want to be the one taken because you were taken into captivity. But then on the flip side, you were the one who was left, which was the one that was left dead. So I've read a lot of um, explanations on that. Which so all that's makes what sense. they just did during war? That's what the Romans did? Yep. Interesting. Yep. I think it was in one of your podcasts too, uh, someone was talking about not one stone you know, would be left. Well, then why is there still the Wailing Wall? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been to Jerusalem. I've been to the Wailing Wall. I wish I knew all this before because it would have been different. <laughs> yeah. But I remember asking our tour guide that. I'm like, why is there still the Wailing Wall if Jesus said there isn't going to be you know, I don't remember exactly what he said, but you know, he's probably like, well, I, this is just one little piece of blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I know, I'd be so curious to see like what the response is, but no, and this was another thing that I learned um, in a book that I read. And yeah, I had um, David on the podcast, we were talking about that. And that is actually the Roman fortress, part of mm. the Roman fortress that they had built. Um, it's not a part of the temple because if it is, Jesus's prophecy is, is false. It didn't happen like That's that. Because so he wild. said, not one stone shall be left here upon another. And when you look at Josephus, he documents that. Everything was, was burnt down. They literally burnt and pulled up the foundation because they were burning to get all the gold, the mm. Romans, because the temple was full of gold and built with gold. So they were burning everything to take this gold. So... Yeah, it's well. There's a lot of prayers ro rolled up on the Roman wall then in Jerusalem, <laughs> right? I mean, it shifts everything with with what you kind yeah. of look at the events of today. Going yeah, on. that was a great description. So then, after they come back, okay, the temple fell. So what is that? Th the next three and a half years, like if we're looking at the, I can't remember. It's like times times and half a time or whatever w within mm -hmm. that seven years. Mm -hmm. So everywhere you see that time, times, and half a time, mm -hmm. from my study, it's talking about that three and a half year war. Okay. Um, but where you get the other three and a half, that's the 70th week um, of Daniel. So that's kind of what you're thinking of, the 70th week of Daniel, that first three and a half years. So there's two different things here um, that I think people get confused in their, in their minds. So the 70th week of Daniel was when Jesus started his ministry. Three and a half year ministry, he was crucified midway through that 70th week. And that last three and a half years to fulfill that 70th week was in 34 AD was when Stephen was martyred. And Paul was, or Saul at that time, mm -hmm. was um, met by Jesus and changed to, to Paul to where then he went and reached the Gentiles. So everything shifted in the church in 34 AD with the Gentiles really being reached. Um, and so, when it comes to Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Revelation, it's talking about the time times and half a time, 42 months, 1260 days. That's what you find in Daniel as well. Okay. Okay. So, the cool part about all this is that is that old covenant. And there was there a time then like Jesus gave them that generation, the Jews, to figure it out. Like, I am the Messiah. Like, follow me. And then when that temple fell, that was like, would you say the total end of the old covenant going into the new covenant? We talked about this a little bit. Or was mm -hmm. it when he was resurrected? I mean, does it matter that much? I think... Um here, here's really where I where I stand on this. I think during that time, um, from when, when Jesus came, when he was resurrected, ascended to heaven, he began reigning at that point, and the new covenant was in effect for those who accepted it. Right, and if you were going to live under the old covenant at that time, you had to live a hundred percent under it. You couldn't take anything out of that. So you still need to be doing sacrifices. You needed to be doing all of this. But then also on the flip side, you're like, that negated everything that Jesus did on the cross. So there was a time um, in for that 40 years where th th it was both, both covenants were in effect, the old covenant still and the new covenants. And really you see that 
in Hebrews 8.13, it says, in that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and is growing old is ready to vanish away. That's talking about that time frame, that that generation. What was so, that again? Hebrews what? Hebrews 8, 13. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, and I'm reading out of the New King James, um, but it says, yeah, he has made the first obsolete, talking mm -hmm. about the covenants, now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. That's because the old covenant had not vanished away at that point because the temple was standing. Yeah. So, it's just really cool really wild uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and this is where you get into people like totally like no that's not right you know and and pushing right. back on it but to me it makes complete sense and it makes sense all of the book of hebrews then because hebrews was written during that time frame during that 40 years all of all of these books were in the new testament yeah. so yeah. yeah yeah so i i mean i believe then when the temple fell that was the the dismantling of the old covenant with the temple because like i said temple was the very embodiment of that old covenant and at that point it was the new covenant was the only way so it was like an overlapping in a yeah, sense yeah and it's almost like jesus is like this has to happen or you're not going to totally live in the grace that i died for like you know because we would be so tempted and the jews would continue to be so tempted and maybe I, you know, I don't know if this just allowed them to maybe look to Messiah more, only God knows, but like if that building was still standing, the temptation would be to just continue to live under that old covenant. Yeah. And people today yeah. are still trying to live over, you know, trying to yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, they would still be sacrificing. So at yeah. least with it, with it taken away, I mean, goodness, you think about it, that was almost 2000 years ago. And it's not rebuilt. And so, you know, in But in now looking, people are talking about rebuilding. Yes. It. Yes. And that's I don't know. I in my heart, I do not feel that it will be rebuilt. Um, I could be wrong. And if I am wrong, then it is, you know, it, and I'll accept that. But I do not feel it will be rebuilt. I think that is a push of the enemy because we are the temple. Mm -hmm. You and I are the temple and the Holy Spirit, God dwells in us and where he dwells is his glory, mm -hmm. right? And so when it says the glory will fill the whole earth, that's believers. Like yeah. I, I, I can't see that any other way. Like that is us because we are the temple. And so if we are so focused on rebuilding a temple, the red heifers coming all of our eyes are, are are on this just to look out for a one-man antichrist which when you understand daniel it's not talking about that um it, it takes our eyes off of what we should be doing so Amen. i that's why i love talking about this because i think you're really right about that you know people are it's fun it's kind of fun to like okay what's happening you know let's yeah. try to dig into this and see what's going on and that led you to actually what you're talking about right now which is cool that's given yeah. you more peace and more freedom but what like what is the great commission i mean what it's like what did jesus ask us to do and so for so focused on what's going to happen and you know even politically right like what's going to happen you know this season, this year in politics, right? Yeah. What's yeah. happening? Is the Euphrates River drying up? Well, yeah, it kind of is. Okay. So like maybe Jesus is going to come back soon. But if we just put all our eggs in one basket and sit there and worry and wait, yeah. we're not going to be yeah. fulfilling the Great Commission. And yep. we're not being obedient to his call. Yep. Absolutely. And I, I'm not even kidding when I say this. I have had people reach out to me on Instagram after I kind of started talking more about about this saying, wow, like I have an aunt who quit her job mm -hmm. in 2020, sat in her house and is waiting for the rapture. And I've had other people say, um, yeah, I'm not pursuing the career that I want to to pursue because it's the end times. Like, why, why should I even do that? Or um, I, I chose not to have children mm -hmm. because of not knowing what's going to happen and it being the end times, so there's no point and i don't want them to be born in the tribulation with an mm -hmm. antichrist all of these things like think about how smart the enemy is yeah to bring this in 
to stop us, to stop us in our tracks. But the Great Commission, we are to make disciples, right? We are to spread the gospel and grow the kingdom. And again, back to Daniel, Daniel 2, there, the vision of that Nebuchadnezzar had and Daniel interpreted it, you you have the statue, right? You have the, the um, boils down to, you have Babylon, like the, the beast kingdoms, you have Babylon, you have the Medo-Persian um, empire, the Grecian empire and the Roman empire, and then you have 10 toes of iron mixed with clay. And it, it says, and then in the days of those kings, a stone comes that is cut without human hands, right? Crashes in and it grows into a large mountain. I believe with my whole heart that was Jesus at his first coming and the mountain is the church, the ecclesia, yeah. and it grows into a mountain. And so if we are so focused on an antichrist, I think the enemy stops us. He stops us in our tracks from doing what God tells all believers all throughout the Bible, I believe, is to carry on, right? We talked about this at the at the conference of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, the letter to the captives. What were they to do? Mm -hmm. They were to build houses, to dwell in them, have children so that they may increase and not be diminished. That's yeah. still for us today. Hmm. So yeah. That's my this, rant on that. <laughs> no, I, I go girl. <laughs> the gates of hell will not prevail against the church and yeah. I, you know the enemy is just such a legalist and such a jerk because mm -hmm. even like 2020 you know it's like oh my goodness you know yeah. everyone stopped he stopped everyone in their tracks but yeah. what the enemy used for evil god used for good because look at how much information we yeah. we have uh, been able to just learn more about yeah. jesus more about what he has for us and the freedom that he's called us into. You know, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And I, f I think like anytime we're stuck in some th sort of theological pattern where we feel just very constrained and, and fear-based, we have mm -hmm. to ask ourselves what, what that is yeah. about and if that yeah. is from the Lord. Yeah, very, very true because perfect love casts out all fear and who is perfect love? The Lord, Jesus you know, and and having him dwell in us, like, I, I really feel like when we are fearful, it quenches the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And if if doctrine or theology, like these different views, if they are, I, uh, I mean, this is where people get angry with me, but, <laughs> but if it's fear based, is it from God? Is it truth? And, you know, I look at Revelation, I well, even, even, the narrative throughout the entire Bible, the entire Old Testament, um, they had prophets, the Israelites had prophets for coming destruction. And why then in the first century would God stop using a prophet to speak to his people, telling them what was coming, mm -hmm. right? And so I honestly see Revelation and John being the prophet of the first century of he gets this vision and writes it down just like Isaiah did, just like Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all in relation to the first destruction of the temple. Mm -hmm. I see Revelation now in reference to the destruction of the temple, and I believe we're at the end of Revelation, um, to be honest. And we're still waiting for His glorious return. We're waiting for that. We're waiting for all things to be made new and this full like culmination of heaven and earth again back to the state of the garden of eden mm -hmm. and but i also believe um that it's an already but not yet so this is more of an all millennial um viewpoint of with jesus reigning now we have all this spiritually right now we are a new creation in christ right now our spirit is made new but yet our our physical being still groans and earns you know yearns for this full restoration so if that makes sense like it's an already happening spiritually but we're still waiting for the physical to be renewed yeah absolutely and it doesn't mean life isn't hard right and it yes, doesn't mean yes. we know there's an antichrist spirit roaming yes, you know there's yes. the prince of the power of the air but yeah. christ is the head over all and we stand yeah. in victory so there's nothing yep. we need to fear um yep. so that kind of that's amazing. Like that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. That's a lot. Yeah. How'd you do all that? <laughs> Did you have it all over your computer? That's a lot. Of 
Um, not <laughs> what I, I just said. <laughs> well, what we talked about, yeah, I did have some notes as far as like the all of it discourse, but no, like I just, I just get so passionate about it because it does change everything. Once you mm-hmm. see, like, we don't have to be scared. Um, does that mean that evil's not going to be present? No, like evil's here until Jesus comes and yeah. crushes Satan for good and he's cast into the lake of fire. Like yeah. evil will still be here until that happens. But nothing new is under the sun. Like there's mm-hmm. nothing new. There are ups and downs all throughout human history. So, yeah. I mean, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just, something came to my mind. What do you think about then the partial hardening, you know, upon Israel until the full number of the Gentiles comes in? Like, what do you think is going to happen to Israel at the end? Or Honestly, is it happening is- now, you know? What do you think? I mean, I I think this is another super touchy subject, but I feel like Israel is now the ecclesia, the church, Jews and Gentiles. It's all in relation to if you accept Jesus um, mm-hmm. as your Lord and Savior. And the, the partial hardening, uh, the time of the Gentiles, when you compare that back to um, both Revelation and Matthew, I believe that that was when the Romans were in control. And so I think that part of that has to do with stuff that's already happened, to be honest. So, okay. but I'll get pushback for, for, for that. Hey, I just <laughs> but, wanted to know where you stood. And the cool thing yeah. about like, there is no, you know, we should be unoffendable as Christians. Like we, yeah. I could talk to you about this all day. I might not agree on every point yeah. of it, but yeah, it's like, yeah. wow, this is fascinating. I'm gonna yeah. humble myself, dig into it and pray you know, for the Lord to reveal to me what he wants to share with me. So, so Jenny, okay, so after this, you've learned a ton. You've been, you know, teaching this through your Bible study. Uh, you also have conferences. And I forgot to tell people, you we've been together on your podcast and Revelations uh-huh. podcast before, and more of your testimony is what you gave on the Revelations like a year ago, and it's really good. So go back and listen to that, guys, if you haven't. But how is everything you've learned imperative to understanding the gospel and what Jesus has done for us? Um, I think for me, like I said, it's just really understanding the new covenant and what it means to be made new. And I think mm-hmm. that's the next journey that that the Lord has me on now that I have this understanding. And I really, really do. Like, it's, it's cool when you know that God has you on a journey of like, because you'll hear the same thing yeah. in <laughs> places and you're like, okay, Lord, I get it. Like, and I think that's, that's the next journey that God really has me digging into is what does it mean that we are a new creation? What does it mean to walk in the spirit? You know, we know this as a Christian, but do we really know it? Yeah. And what did Jesus accomplish on the cross? Like, and how important it is for us to walk in that and to enter his rest and know our true identity. Um, I've, I, about a year ago, God was pressing on my heart to write a book and I hmm. had, had an idea. I've started it. I have a few chapters done, um, really just about like corrupting our image. Um, and how the enemy does that corrupts our image. But over the past like few months, I'm like, okay, it needs to go more the route of your identity. Yes. The, the, enemy wants to corrupt our identity and our image. Uh, We are image bearers, but what does it mean that we are made in the image of Christ? And I think when we focus on that, when we stop focusing on looking for an antichrist and and, and the temple and the red heifers, all of this, we can actually focus on what Jesus has for us in the new covenant and what all of it means um, to be image bearers and what we can do for the kingdom. So Mm. that's the journey I've been on with it. Mm, That's beautiful. Now you're speaking my language. That's what I'm passionate (laughs) about is that freedom in Christ and identity is so huge. And and it's a distraction too. I mean, a lot of all all of these, uh, I mean, Revelation was the first book I ever read in the Bible and God God used that to save me, praise God. Uh, Because it just showed me he was the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Like I knew that. But some of the stuff, the red heifers, you know, the third building of the temple, it can be a distraction to just go do what he's asked us to do and to love people well and to be yeah. unoffendable, you know, and yeah. like just go share the gospel. It's actually like really simple, but I think it sometimes is. we make it so complicated. <laughs> it is. It totally is. And just understanding like 
all those people who have said like they haven't had kids or or haven't Mm -hmm. pursued like a career, you know, imagine the freedom that they have then to step out and do the things that are on their heart, like Lord willing, because you're not fearful of the end times. So, Mm -hmm. you know, what's interesting, my son said last week, him and his buddies, I mean, they listen to a lot of things, like he listens to stuff I'm listening to sometimes and I'm recording, whatever. And so, you know, he probably hears more than most people, but he's, they were having a conversation, these 11 to 13 year olds, and he comes home and he's like, mom, I'm afraid of the end times. And I'm like, wait, 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 who are you talking to? What are they saying? And, and it's like, he goes, I want to, I want to like have a family. I want to have kids. And I'm like, yes, in Jesus name, he's got a great plan for you. And so, I mean, the enemy's already trying to instill fear into these little ones, you know, because so much is happening and people are ta- talking about it more than ever. Yep. I I totally understand cuz one of my daughters is the same way. She's mm-hmm. like I want to like I want to have a big family. I want to do these things. And so just think like again, the enemy just knocking people like down in their tracks. Like nope, you're never going to amount to anything and then all the lies that he spews out. Yeah. Um and these poor kids. I mean, I was the same way. I'll be real. Mm-hmm. Like I, I was absolutely like my daughter, like, well, I don't want Jesus to come back until I have my own kids. And so it is, it's such an interesting conversation. But I think if we can just look at things like we don't have to be scared. The majority of this, I believe, has already happened and we are awaiting his return. And then that gets into the question, like, what does the new heaven and new earth look mm-hmm. like? You know, and so there's a lot of different debates about that, but. Well, I can't wait for that. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) I know it's going to be awesome. Well, thank you, Jenny, for being with us. And I'm wondering, could you just like pray uh, before we go for our listeners just to be open hearted and not be triggered and not, you know, worry about this, but just let the Holy Spirit speak to them through this information? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this time together um, and for blessing this conversation between Reagan and myself. I pray that whoever is listening to this today truly just seeks you. And if, you know, if, if someone does feel triggered about it, Lord, I just pray that the Holy Spirit would pinpoint the area that, that they need to maybe work on to, to look at this humbly and look at it with open eyes and through your word, through scripture, and letting scripture interpret scripture, I pray that that those that you have that needed to hear this today just be blessed by this and can leave that fear behind because perfect love does cast out all fear. And I just pray that everyone that's listening, including Reagan and myself, just walk in your pure love and walk in the fullness of of christ and what you have for us and i pray again anyone listening that they are blessed throughout their day for having listened to your word Uh, we are told in revelation that we are blessed when we read it even though it's it appears to be scary scary um i just pray that you would show everyone that it is not scary your word is not scary we do not have to be fearful of it and it's in jesus's name we pray amen Mm, thank you. Beautiful. Thank you for bringing us all of that incredible information, yeah. Jenny. And now how can people find you if they aren't following you already? Um, I am on Instagram under either Jenny Meyer or The Rooted Truth and the website, therootedtruth.com. We have um, our studies up. We have our community, our app um, under The Rooted Truth Collective. And and then also, I mean, my website, just JennyMeyer.com, just a little bit about me and my journey. So, You are on the move, girl. <laughs> it, it, gets, it gets busy, but I love it. Like, I love this, this career shift that God has brought me, you know, and so just good. studying His Word more and more. So, Yeah, it's so good. Okay, well, love you, friend. Thanks for coming on. Anytime. Thank you again. Thank you so much for listening to Revelations Podcast. I am honored and humbled that you are here. If you would like to partner with us and contribute financially to editing and production costs, would you go to www.therevelationspodcast.com and hit the contribute button. Otherwise, go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and give us a five-star rating. It lends credibility to the show and it helps spread the word about what God is doing. Thank you so much for supporting the Revelations Podcast. Podcast.